This is hell. Our uniquely European faith in progress is a system of dominance founded in racism and moral superiority that has been destructive to our planet, even destroying civilizations that had actually shown more progress than ours. Here to help us examine our misguided faith in progress, author Ben Ehrenreich wrote the article, After the Storm, Progress, and the Demanded Quest for Historical Purity, which appears in the Baffler number 43. Welcome to This is Hell, Ben. Thank you, Chuck. How's it going? Good. Ben is the author of the novels Ether and The Suitors. His latest nonfiction book is 2017's The Way to the Spring, Life and Death in Palestine. You can follow Ben on Twitter, at Ben Ehrenreich, and you can find out more about Ben at his website, benehrenreich.net. What do you mean by, and I hate to do this, I hate to parse a title of somebody's work, but what do you mean by historical purity, and who is seeking this historical purity? Well, um, to to make a, a really complicated uh, essay, as, as simple as I can, um, something happened in about the middle of the 18th century, um, and, and two things happened at roughly the same time, more than these two things, and I'm just going to talk about them. Um, and one is that you see the first articulations of what we now understand as the narrative of progress. Um, this notion that things are improving, that time is a on a one-way track um, and it's getting better. Um, and you know, w- one thing that I note in the in the piece is that this is always um, time is always understood also in terms of space, um, in terms of places on the globe. Um, so the the place of the present, which is also the place of the future, is Europe. Um, this is where things are getting better. And the place of the past is for the most part understood as the Americas, which is the sort of the, the most sort of savage and barbaric land, you know, peopled by our barbarian tribes. Um, so progress at once works in time and it, and it you know, traces out this straight arrow from, from savagery um, to the heights of European civilization. And it works as a way of placing the people on the globe on this, on this hierarchy. Um, and at around the same time, um, there was something else going on, which a, a scholar named Martin Bernal wrote about um, a lot in the 80s and 90s in this sort of titanic three-volume work called Black Athena, which was the kind of ethnic scrubbing, um, we could say ethnic cleansing if we want, of, um, of European um, heritage, of the... Of the um, heritage of the Renaissance um, and of, of European civilization properly. Because, you know, if, if Europe was going to be on top, um, if Europe was going to be the, the great inheritor of, of all of um, human history, it needed to give itself a heritage and it needed to give itself a, a very pure lineage. And it did that um, in various ways by denying the African and the Middle Eastern and Mesopotamian um, links to what we now understand as classical civilization to Greek and, and Roman culture. Um, you know, during the, during the Renaissance, which is not that much long, uh, not that you know, distant in time to this period, uh, people had been very happy to understand, first of all, they didn't understand themselves as the, the greatest civilization on earth. They, under, they, they believed very, you know, very clearly that the greatness was in the past. Um, greatness belonged to the Greeks and to the Egyptians, um, and they had no problem um, like admitting the greatness of of other civilizations that were not European. And this stops um, beginning in the in the mid 18th century, so that by the 19th century we have this fiction, um, which we still have today, um, and we you know we see it coming out very clearly in, I think, the, the really heightened racial discourse that's come out since Trump, Trump's election, um, this fiction that there is this thing called Western civilization, which is this straight line of progress that goes from the Greeks, who just sort of exist suddenly in this wonderful, you know, uh, sort of white statued purity um, of, of reason suddenly landing on the earth um, through the Romans um, into Europe. Um, and eventually across the Atlantic to the United States. And then we have this great heritage, uh, which is purely European, and everyone else is sort of these, these awful, irrational savages uh, that would 
still be, you know, kicking around in the dirt if it wasn't for us. And, you know, we see this reflected very clearly in some of Trump's uh, comments about African nations. We see this in uh, in the comments of his supporters all the time and in the discourses of many of our highly respected public intellectuals. Um, and this is, I think, you know, very clearly a discourse of, of white supremacy. Yeah, yeah, that was a fantastic overview. One of the things I was thinking about when reading your article was how we have, uh, since the mid-18th century, we'll get into the writing of uh, Turgot in a little bit that uh, talks about this, but how that kind of thinking about the Western civilization, uh, how that affects our imagination, how it creates a more balkanized world, how us turning... Our, our, uh, Europe, Europe turning its back on past civilizations after revering them for so long, kind of, uh, you know, balkanized the world and made the, the, the Europe in our imagination, Middle East in our imagination, made in Asia in our imagination. None of these things really existed. Was the world more globalized far before globalization? It was it more globalized before 1750 than it is today, because it seems like this reverence for past civilizations would cross borders and not make us as balkanized, would make us more globalized. Were we more of a globalized culture before globalization? I mean, I think the really, you know, going back uh, millions of years, as long as humans have, um, you know, since humans left Africa, Humans have been moving constantly, and, and I mean, and I, I think uh, trade routes go back much farther than we thought they did. Um, global levels of trade, I think, you know, globalization is a is a is an absolutely ancient phenomena. Um, I think Europe certainly, uh, you know, until the you know 14th century certainly uh, was not a particularly sophisticated or cosmopolitan place. It was an incredibly backward place. You know, if at the time, if you wanted to look at where the sort of most exciting civilizations on the on the planet were, you would not look to Europe. Um, you know, you, you would be much more likely to to look to the Indian subcontinent, to to, to China, to the Americas, to parts of Africa, um, where there were you know civilizations that were far more you know technologically and intellectually developed than Europeans were. Um, but you know, one of the things that happened, of course, in 1492 is is the Europeans happen across. The Americas, and more or less accidentally, uh, not entirely accidentally, they did what they could to help it along, but through, you know, the help of, of you know, bacteria um, and viruses, uh, wipe out most of the continent and um, do their best to kill the people that disease doesn't take care of, and then bring all of that wealth back. Um, and with that moment, with that, that with that conquest, Europe was able to start telling itself this story about its superiority uh, and to believe it um, and to try to figure out ideology, ideological ways to account for it, um, you know, narratives that would justify it. Um, and uh, I think, you know, we're still obviously dealing with this. But in that notion of European superiority, in that notion of European progress, if Europeans really believe in that notion of progress, and if they really have that faith in progress, then how is 20th century fascism allowed? How does fascism fit into that notion of faith in progress? You know, I mean, I think fascism, uh, I think if you look at uh, the you know, intellectual roots of European fascism, whether they're you know, the Italian fascism or, or Nazism, um, they had a profound belief in progress, which is, I think, deeply tied to um, to the you know a lot of the nineteenth um, and eighteenth century thinkers that we that you know are still quite accepted today. Um, you know, there, there was a profound and I think even utopian, although we look back on it with horror, um, belief that uh, human society could be could be perfected. Um, and I, I think you know, in the this notion of a you know, certainly, if you look, if you look at the, um, at you know, if you look at the architecture of fascism, whether it's in in, uh, in Germany or in, in Italy, um, it's calling back on these classical roots. Um, you know, Hitler, the the intellectuals around Hitler did everything they could to tell this to tell a story of a of racial purity that went back for centuries, um, and. Uh, 
you know, and, and that very much, I think, is the same story that we that we see in uh, that I'm describing here um, of all connections to the rest of the world being um, sort of cut off and rejected um, to, in order to establish this pure lineage. So the sense of European superiority actually, obviously, feeds into the rise of Nazism. You also write that the first explicit articulation, I want to make sure we get to the writing of Turgot, the first explicit articulation of faith and progress is generally agreed to have appeared in a speech delivered in 1750 by the brilliant political economist and Robert Jacques Turgot, then just 23, it is surely no coincidence that an early evangelist of economic liberty would also be the first to lay out the ideology that would everywhere accompany the spread of capitalism. Then you quote Turgot writing in 1773, all branches of commerce ought to be free, equally free, and entirely free. Can capitalism succeed without faith in progress? How much does capitalism depend on faith in progress to succeed? I, I don't know if capitalism can succeed, and I, I, uh, but um, but I think uh, you know progress has since the beginning of beginnings of capitalist um, economy and the politics that associated were associated with that. You know, progress has been the religion that accompanied the capitalism everywhere it went. Um, and you know, it's funny. I was thinking when we think about climate change and what we're all looking at right now, because that's sort of what got me thinking about a lot of this stuff is trying to, trying to understand what was happening. Um, that if you accept that climate change is real, um, and if you accept that um, it's caused by human endeavors and by, you know, by industrialization, um, then you can't also really believe that capitalism worked out that well. Um, and you can't believe that technological civilization, as we know, it, industrial civilization worked out that well. And you also can't really believe that any of this story that people have in, in the West have been telling themselves um, for the last 270 odd years um, is an accurate story. Um, because things, you know, may have gotten better for a little while for some some amount of people on the on the globe, but it's actually destroying everything and going to make it impossible for, for human life to to survive here. Um, so that, that's a pretty a pretty serious challenge to to this narrative. What would you? Because I, I have actually heard this on talk radio. Unfortunately, I don't know why I would waste my time listening, but unfortunately, I have heard this said. <laughs> uh, I've often heard people from the far right when people are uh, complaining about uh, the lack of indigenous rights or treatment of. Uh, Native Americans, uh, they will retort with, uh, too bad, we won. What would you say to someone who argues that European civilization must have been and must continue to be more advanced because it is what dominates the areas that were once controlled by indigenous people? Is the United States proof that European culture is and was more advanced than indigenous cultures everywhere? You know, I I think... um... I go back to what I was just saying that I think the 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 one you know very painful bit of truth that we all have to figure out how to reckon with right now is that the way we are living um, is destroying the planet not only for us but for you know generations to come for many many generations to come and for many other species other than, than the human species um, and. So it's kind of hard to say that we won, right? <laughs> um, that there were people living on uh, in this hemisphere for millennia before we were who didn't manage to mess it up like we did, um, who managed to live with it, you know, in in some considerably greater level of harmony than we have. Um, and in a very short period of time, we have, uh, you know, destroyed it not only for ourselves, but for, um, you know, very likely for centuries to come. Um, I think I think that's pretty hard to rebut unless you take the uh, you know denialist path of saying no climate change isn't real. It's just weird weather sometimes. Is faith in progress? Faith in elites? Do elites need the masses to have faith in progress to remain the elites? Does our belief that we are always moving forward keep them in power? And once we no longer have the belief uh, that we're continually moving forward. That's when the elites lose power. You know, I mean, I think the complicated thing is that, that like, it, it's worked for elites, but it's also been a powerful ideology for people who are not in power. 
you know, that for for various, uh, you know, revolutionary groups over the last, you know, couple hundred years as well, um, believing that you can, that the way things are isn't the way they have to be, believing that we can perfect human society um, through our own actions um, has been really powerful people for people who are excluded from power also. Um, so I, I don't, you know, um, the, the last uh, section of the piece was about um, a a different source for for than the one I've been describing for um, the ideology of progress, which is a an understanding and a belief, which I think is a fairly sort of religious and spiritual belief that like that uh, that human beings are, you know, in some ways. Um, you know that we that God is in all of us, right? Um, and that we can that we can be what God is. This this kind of very powerful mystical belief in our own capabilities um, has been something which people have also used to combat elites and to combat injustice and to try to make societies more just. So I, I, I don't want to simply say that this is a uh, a racist ideology that we have to be to be done with because I think it's also been a a very powerful um, source of of you know of change for for the better and it's something i think if we, if we were to get rid of that entirely this belief that that we can actually affect uh our own lives and, and the way our societies you know are organized in the world um we wouldn't have a whole lot of chance of of, of getting through the challenges that we're now facing you write as an ideology that put European culture at the pinnacle of human history and consigned everyone else to time's lowland wastes. Progress would function at once as an explanation of European dominance and a rationale for the slaughter and pillage on which it depended and continues to depend. How much do you see this idea of progress or faith in progress at work with say, Trump's policy in Venezuela? How do we view the world differently when we see progress as a project of dominance, not of actual progress that benefits anyone by the conquer? You know, like as as an ideology of, you know, short-sighted elites, um, you know, to, to think that, that, you know, how many years is it since uh, the toppling of Saddam Hussein? It's... Uh, 16 years, right? Um, 16 years after the last time that American elites, you know, with the enthusiastic support of, uh, you know, oil companies and the uh, and arms dealers, um, toppled the government, um, thinking they could just sort of take the oil and make everything, you know, rearrange things as they liked and everything that would be fine. And instead, we've seen, you know, hundreds of thousands of people killed and absolute, you know, absolute disaster. Um, and you have people like John Bolton and the, uh, some of the neocons who've worked their way into um, Trump's administration, um, who once again have this um, you know, patently uh, insane belief that they can um, remake the globe according to their desires um, and that it will somehow be in the... I think these people do believe that they are a force for good. Um, and that, uh, and that they're doing the Lord's work in a way. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, th- I think it, it requires a, a sort of pseudo religious faith in order to, to believe that. You write of the political economist, uh, mid 18th century political economist Turgot, uh, the first thing he hastened to toss over was the notion that all things are alive and infused with divinity. This idea then still pervasive in the animistic beliefs of conquered and not yet conquered peoples across the globe in the folk beliefs of Europe and in the more pantheistic strands of its esoteric theologies was by Turgot's reckoning one of those delusive analogies to which the first men in their immaturity abandoned themselves with so little thought. The task of denuding the natural world of agency and divinity was apparently an important one and could not be neglected. You write for the grand procession of progress to march. The stage had to be first be cleared of rivals. All the world must be dead and man alone alive, rushing to the glory of his fate. Again, that's it's all Turgot, I'm sorry. How much did Turgot set the stage for not only European colonialism and institutional racism and slavery and so many other horrible things, 
but also for rapacious capitalism and a lack of any concern for the environment or how one's own impact on the environment might affect your own quality of life. To what degree did Turgot set in motion the environmental destruction that we're suffering from today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think not just to go. I mean, I think, you know, you certainly see this uh, earlier in Descartes and you see it in, in a lot of French Enlightenment thinking and Enlightenment thinking as it spread around um, around Europe um, was this real disdain um, for the notion that anything, you know, that anything was alive or had consciousness or thought or at all other than humans. Um, the humans alone were possessed with reason. Um, and this is replacing, you know, in Europe, uh, even a, um, you know, deep strands of belief that imagined, um, that the divine was alive and everything, you know, that, 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 that the sacred sort of pulsed through the entire, um, the entirety of the, of the universe, um, which is, you know, certainly what a lot of, uh, non-European traditions have, have believed as well. And I think if you don't believe that there is anything sacred except for you. You don't believe there's anything capable of thought or, or consciousness except for you. Then it's really easy not only to you know to wipe out people who you regard as savages, but to to rape the earth. You know to regard the earth as dead. Um, and this works very well um, as an ideology for capitalism, um, as an ideology that. See, looks at looks at things and sees only the way the the wealth that can be extracted from them, you know. That looks at uh, that looks at the earth and all of its you know diversity and beauty, and and sees only the you know the what can be mined from it um, and sold. Um, and you know, I, I think it, it's with that kind of thinking that we that we start to map out the absolutely extraordinary levels of devastation that you know that have been visited on the planet in the last in the last century and a half. You write of the mid-19th century feeling toward faith and progress. To question faith and progress with any seriousness was to marginalize yourself as a crank, a heretic, or a fool. To what extent has that changed from uh, the mid-19th century, mid-18th century even? After all, in the late 1970s, Margaret Thatcher did have Tina. There is no alternative. And many of the pro-financialized neoliberal globalizationists of the mid-1980s, mid-1990s, had the same dismissiveness of anyone questioning their faith in their progress in globalization. Are those who question progress still today seen as a crank, a heretic, and a fool, and dismissed? Yeah, I think to a large degree it still puts you out there. I mean, I, mean, I think, you know, certainly even in the 19th century, you know, you had philosophical feature, uh, figures like, like, say, Friedrich Nietzsche, um, you know, who were profoundly suspicious of, of this narrative. Um, and certainly after the First World War, um, you had a, an entire generation of people who were disgusted by this narrative um, and, and whose, whose you know, entire intellectual formation came out of a rejection of this narrative. But I think despite that, and despite the fact that, you know, that war was followed by another even more destructive war, um, that I think because it's, it's basically the ideology of capitalism it has remained with, uh, you know, with the with the strength of a of, of a religious belief as the sort of core self understanding of our culture um, that things are getting better, that technology and science will bring us there, that human rationality can solve all problems, um, and you know that I think no matter how many you know thinkers have questioned it, no matter how many, how many artists have rejected it, um, still remains. I think quite fundamental to the way most people in the U S and Europe, and, and I think actually in large parts of the rest of the globe now, um, see the world. Um, and I think it's been, it, it's been fundamentally destructive. We've had guests on our show over the last several years who argue that neither the British empire or any imperial project or the U S superpower could have happened without capitalism and the capitalism couldn't have succeeded without colonialism, and colonialism could not have succeeded without slavery. Can we blame it all on faith in progress? Did faith in progress cause slavery and all the evils of colonialism, as well as the great power of empires over the past 500 years? No, I don't think, you know, nothing, nothing's quite that simple. I mean, slavery, you know, there, there's been slavery in human societies for, for thousands of years. 
Um, but I think this belief in progress has accompanied it in a way that you can't really, you can't pull it out that one is the cause and the other is the effect, but has accompanied um, capitalism and, and capitalism's outreach across the globe, which has been a, you know, experienced as, as colonialism. Um, and you can't really separate them from one another. Um, I mean, I think progress came about as a result of the the conquests, European conquests of, of the rest of the planet in the late 15th and early 16th centuries um, as a way for Europe to, to kind of justify and understand what, what it had done and, and the wealth that it had, it had gained through these conquests. Um, and it allowed, I think it became especially powerful in the 19th century, both because it functioned so well alongside of capitalism um, and because it continued to uh, to justify the, you know, genocides that, that went along with colonialism, um, that, you know, as, as European and uh, North American powers, you know, divided the globe up among themselves um, and, you know, really authored, you know, horrendous crimes. Um, pretty much on every other corner of the globe, uh, they needed to still tell themselves that they were superior and virtuous, and they found a way to do it. Um, and, uh, and, and that's, I think, what the ideology of progress has worked for and still works for. Uh, you write that if Europe represented the mature stage of human development, it would need a lineage. And then you talk about this lineage, lineage going back to the Greeks, as you mentioned earlier, that this image would not have been recognized by either the Greek contemporaries or by their inhabitants of the time of Greeks being like the epitome of human civilization uh, or of the inhabitants of the continents being mowed under by Western uh, civilization was irrelevant to the larger project of historical re- reclamation. Plato and Aeschylus became the heritage of the English, the Germans, and the far-flung white Americans. Greek joined Latin as an indispensable part of the education of the European elite. Classics emerged as a discipline. Does our study of Greek civilization and the classics, our reverence of them, whether you know we realize it or not, does that reinforce a false European connection to Greece based on ideas that are filled with white and European supremacy. Yeah, absolutely, and I, you know, I think that this, um, you know, it, it was in the late 18th and uh, early 19th century that that Greek entered the, you know, educated upper class uh, Europeans knew Latin before that, but they started to learn Greek too, um, and to understand Greeks as somehow their ancestors. Um, and this, you know, is one of the things that allowed the English to feel pretty okay about, uh, you know, going to Greece and taking all of the lovely sculptures and whatnot and putting them in the British Museum, right? Because it kind of belonged to them to begin with, right? It was, it was theirs more than the people who lived there and didn't know how to take care of it. Um, but, but absolutely, I think, um, I think it's also important to understand that that the notion we have of who the Greeks were and what they what that means as, that they were the uh, you know as they were the sort of the fathers of, of our civilization um, is a is completely distinct from how they understood themselves um, you know the Greeks I think I mentioned earlier uh, were in awe of the Egyptians um, and had no had no problem um, talking about what they had borrowed from them and what they had taken from them um, also had no problem taking uh, talking about what they had taken um, from you know from points further east uh, from from the Phoenicians from from Levantine cultures um, and you know understood themselves in a context which we have pretty much erased when we talk about the Greeks um, I, you know it's kind of like all of those lovely white sculptures um, those white marble sculptures you know used to be painted they used to be very colorful and now they're all white um, and I think a, sort of a similar process has happened. Where all all of that color was sort of bleached out, so that we could remember them as these these, these pure white people, you know, sort of just like us. Sheesh. So, uh, with this idea of faith and progress and uh, European superiority. You write that it's quite a fantasy, the trafficker in human suffering reborn as enlightened liberator, his transformation gratefully acknowledged by the charges he so recently tormented. The roots of white savior complex run at least two and a quarter centuries deep, and you trace those roots back to this idea of faith and progress. Does faith in progress, then, 
and we we're touching on this with Venezuela, but does it rationalize things like humanitarian military intervention that we're invading a foreign country for its own good that we know better because we are better? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things I mentioned in the um, in the article was um, the, the sort of second great early text of, of uh, about progress came from the Marquis de Condorcet um, about forty something years after Turgot, um, and um, one of the and, and he's a bit more self-critical in some ways than, than Turgot is. Um, he's willing to talk about some of the, the horrors that Europeans have have authored, such as slavery. Um, but he also, in his in his vision, it's Europeans who will right these wrongs, and they'll do it so that they can guide um, the their victims, um, you know, towards a greater civilization, which is their own civilization. Um, so there's the, there's this absolutely sort of, uh, you know, um, paternalistic notion that it's Europeans that will guide the rest of the world um, to, to greater civilization um, and, you know, take everyone along with us on this wonderful road to progress. Um, and, yeah, I think we, we, we still see that absolutely. And the, it was there in the justifications for, you know, the colonial adventures of the 19th and early 20th century. Um, and it's there, for instance, in, you know, some of the rhetoric that we would get out of Bush and Rumsfeld uh, in their invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, we, we don't really see it from Trump because he's not really articulate enough, I think, to, to say these things. But, uh, but we see it in some of the, the, the figures in his administration as well. You're right that Condorcet, who you're just mentioning, was a brave man and every bit the liberal hero. He had only the most passionate and eloquent words of condemnation for slavery, the oppression of women, and the brutal exploitation of colonized people. Still, his certitude rested on a deep and unquestioned conviction in the moral superiority of Europe, despite all the dizzying, fast-multiplying evidence to the contrary. To what extent do you believe a feeling of moral superiority can undo all the good one may try to accomplish by being anti-racist, by being feminist, by opposing slavery and exploitation. To what degree does moral superiority, a feeling of moral superiority, actually undermine causes like uh, being in opposition to slavery and exploitation? Well, I'm not sure if it's the the feeling that undermines it, but I, I think that um, you know, so long as you believe. Uh, in your in your own uh, in your own superiority, you won't see anything. You won't see anything at all except yourself. Um, and and I think that you know there's a sense in which progress works as this this, this beautiful mirror that Europeans have looked into um, for the last couple hundred years, which which you know reflects back a very beautiful you know sort of hazy, beautiful, noble uh, image of ourselves. Um, and I think. Uh, you know, as long as you're only seeing yourself, um, you are not capable of moral action in any in any real sense. Um, you know, the, the only way to to do right in the world uh, is to see the world, um, to see other people and other beings. You know, in in their suffering and in their strength. Um, and if you if you fail to see that, uh, you can kind of only bumble and only mess things up and only get, sort of only keep making the same mistakes again and again. Just one last question for you, I believe. Let me make sure. Is that correct? No, I got two questions for you. Uh, sorry about that, Ben. Uh, you mentioned, and you started at the beginning of our uh, conversation today, you mentioned the work Black Athena by Martin Bernal and how he cautions of history. There are no simple origins. You explained that for Bernal, it is never a question of a direct and singular genetic inheritance of roots leading up to a trunk and bifurcating into branches. Human history, he suggested, is more like a river splitting into often to tributaries, merging and diverging again and again, or perhaps like a crowd joining arms and letting go, splitting into smaller groups that at times reach out to clasp hands with one another. How does viewing history as a river rather than having faith in progress change the way we view history? Does viewing history as a river to some extent even potentially de-weaponize a historical uh, view based on faith in progress? 
Yeah, I, sh- I should hope so. Um, I mean, if you, if you, if you, you know, don't allow yourself to believe that you're in possession of this one lineage, um, but instead understand that there, are, you know, infinite, intricate, intersecting lineages everywhere, um, then it's a lot harder to um, to justify. Uh, the kind of domination that we've been talking about. Um, and, you know, I, I think, you know, our only hope as humans, you know, at this point is um, not just not just not believing that we that we, you know, as, as Europeans are, or, you know, are um, at the kind of receiving end of this one great tradition. Um, and to under, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm being unclear, but not just to understand that this is this is a question of humans being inter, interconnected to one another, right? The, 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 but this is also a question of all species being to get interconnected to one another and all forms of life. Like this is this is our only hope at this point um, to not see ourselves as this you know exceptional superior creatures, um, but ones that are intricately bound up. Um, with everything else that's out here, and and there are there and to to try and reject the kind of hierarchical views that we've that we've held on to for so long, which put us on this pinnacle above everything else, um, and to understand that we you know we're 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 all in this together, and we all need each other, um, and uh, and that the kind this this understanding of ourselves um, as special and unique and superior. Um, has only led and will only lead to our own destruction. We have been speaking with author Ben Ehrenreich, who wrote the article, After the Storm, Progress, and the Demented Quest for Historical Purity, which appears in Baffler number 43. Ben is the author of a couple of novels, Ether and The Suitors. His most recent nonfiction book is 2017's The Way to the Spring, Life and Death in Palestine. You can follow Ben on Twitter at Ben Ehrenreich, and you can find out more about Ben at BenEhrenreich.net. We have a direct link for you at our website, thisishell.com. One last question for you, Ben, and as we do with all of our guests, our final question is the question from hell. The question we hate to ask, you might hate to answer. Our audience is going to hate your response. Do we need to lose faith in progress in order to progress? Do we need to get away from this idea that we are inevitably headed towards a Star Trek utopian future in order for us to actually get to a Star Trek utopian future? Now, that's an easy question. That's not from hell. <laughs> um, um, let me first say that the, uh, the essay that ran in the bathroom, another thing I've been talking about now, is uh, just part of a book which I've been working on, which uh, hopefully will find its way into the world very soon. So please be on the lookout for that. But um, but yeah, absolutely. I, I think uh, in order to you know to reckon with uh, the demands of the future of our of our children, our grandchildren, all the generations we don't know yet, um, to to reckon with the demands of the past that the dead make on us, that our ancestors make on us, um, you know, we have to reach out to all of them, and that and 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 that means getting rid of this this belief that time is this one-way track that will inevitably lead some of us to perfection. Uh, I mean, shedding that entirely. Um, and I think only by doing that um, is, there, is there any hope at all um, that we can learn to live with each other and with other species on this planet and, and with the, the planet and, you know, every other speck of dust in the cosmos. Oh, it's ben, when is your book going to be coming out, do you know? Don't know yet. Soon, I hope. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, when it does, I want to make sure. You, who's your publisher? The book's got to get finished first. All right. Okay. I wasn't too sure yeah. if you're working on it. But uh, so, yeah, when as soon as the book comes out, uh, make sure that we'll make sure that we stay in contact with you because I definitely want to have you back on the air. This was uh, not only a fascinating conversation, this is really spectacular writing. There's so much that we didn't, I mean, we've been talking for over 40 minutes, and there's so much that we didn't even touch on about this book. Uh, you write about Walter Benjamin and uh, a painting that he had of Paul Clay that has this great interpreta- reinterpretation of history. It really is a fantastic article so thank you so much for being on our show and we look forward to having you back on in the near future oh thank you it's been a real pleasure to talk to you take care that again is ben ehrenreich you can find all of his work at ben ehrenreich.net you've been listening to a this is hell interview 
For more interview health and to support the show, visit thisishell.com.